Bobby Kahn, we're on Ridge, and, and they're going to tell us about their epic experience of sailing, I mean, a wayfarer around Great Britain. I mean, my, my experience of a wayfarer was Sorry. doing my dinghy instructors at Queen Mary Reservoir, <laughs> and there is no way I would want to be sleeping, but I'm guessing yeah. it's not any we old wayfarer. You sound wafer. quite sane, yeah. And do, 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 what's that? You sound quite sane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe that's the that's <laughs> key. And so it took. I had to come and ask you this morning about the name of the boat, um, Nipper GG. Nippy GG. So tell me, what's that all about? Yeah. So briefly, that's uh, it's made up of. Uh, so my grandfather bought the boat, uh, the 1960 boat show, and he named it after his four children, uh, and used the first two letters of their name, which was Nick, Penny, Jeff, and Jill. Wicked. Yeah, of which Nick, who's 83, is manning a stand as we speak. Oh, I'm going to go and say hello. Well, enjoy, and I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. Right, then. Are we on? All right. Well, okay, here we go. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, just the first opening slide. Excuse my voice. It's disappearing. Uh, so, the main overview of what we did was we managed to sail all the way around Britain, and we were the first team to have done it non-stop and unassisted. And in that process, we managed to uh, also become the fastest open boat, including uh, multi-hulls and mono-hulls, to sail around Britain. It took us 15 days and four hours. Uh, we also managed to break some other kind of wayfarer records. So we, we uh, sailed for 132 miles, nautical miles in 24 hours. That was our first day out. That was exciting. And... Uh, just trying to think what the other one was. Uh, uh, longest continuous oh, sail. Lo longest continuous sail. Yes, yeah, so Frank Dyer, who invented it, said no one could spend more than 11 days in a wayfarer, and I think he's probably right. But, but we managed somehow to do 15 days in four hours. Cool, yeah. So a lot of people ask the, the question, how did it all start? And uh, like any good adventure, it started in one of these. So uh, after a couple of pints of tribute, um, after the last record was beaten in 2014, uh, yeah, Rich and I, we, we put together a bit of a plan and uh, yeah, we, we started the wheels, motion, um, we put the wheels in motion back, back in 2014. But I think the real story sort of actually starts way back in, uh, in the 50s, uh, where basically the uh, story of a, a guy and a girl, of course, and... Uh, there's a, a keen, uh, the guys are keen, um, uh, uh, Motorcycle, motorcycle racer and his girlfriend at the time gave him an ultimatum and luckily for all of us uh, granddad chose granny and uh, sold the bike and took up sailing and later they had they no, they really took to it in a big way and they bought uh, Nippy Gigi our boat uh, in 1960 from the boat show as I said before and he named it after their four kids which they ended up having and um, yeah, and that's, oh, you can't see the LCD screen, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's the Nick, Nick, Penny, Jeff and Jill in the photo there. And that's my, that's my dad, who's actually the same age as my son now in the far left. So yeah, so this, the, the, the Hodgson family really took to sailing in a big way. And uh, my grandfather won a nationals and then, uh, and then my uncle and dad won uh, five national championships between them. And they actually went on to then uh, get onto the Olympic squad sailing the tornado through the 70s. Uh, Rich and I, so we met basically at university, at the University Surf Club, and we got up to all sorts of adventures. And we traveled the world doing a number of things. And, um, but yeah, something that really sort of cemented our relationship, I guess, and had some link with what we did now is, uh, yeah, amongst Amongst lots of other activities, uh, we were involved in a diving accident in, um, in uh, South Devon 20 years ago now. And to cut a long story short, I was basically trapped in a, in a wreck and uh, I, I ran out of air completely, pretty deep down. And Rich was basically the end of his air too. Um, but yeah, instead of, instead of swimming for the surface, he buddy breathed what little air he had left until he basically just got me out and we drew the last breath on his tank, still pretty deep, and we swam to the surface basically on one breath. And uh, yeah, so without this idiot, I wouldn't be here today. And um, <laughs> so, yeah. Don't clap, um, it's not clever. Yeah, so I've been uh, praying that I haven't had to repay the favor ever since. 
um, so yeah, we appreciate we we could uh, we couldn't do this alone. Uh, so yeah, we need we needed we need the team. Apart from all the you know preparation of everything, uh, we needed really constant, accurate weather updates coming to the boat all the time, so we could come in and get away from uh, you know from an impending storm, but also for tactically to look at tides and weather and how we were going to sail the boat around. So uh, yeah, so it was a big family affair, and basically there's um, NI Nick in the top left here. He was basically stationed in Southampton, monitoring basically weather the whole time, and he was in conversation with my dad in the top right and Auntie Penny, uh, there's the G and G and PE, and they basically and uh, we yeah they we basically um, retrofitted an old motorhome and made, turned into like a storm chaser type vehicle with uh, you know, electrics and laptops and satellite comms in the back and they were monitoring uh, weather as well and between them all they were basically feeding us pretty accurate information as we were, as we were going around and not to mention my wife as well which is at the back and she was involved with all sorts of things as well. Yep, so there's the, there's the uh, uh, Nippy Gigi Round Britain tour bus and uh, yeah, so how much preparation is there? Right, well, uh, quite a lot. So yeah, basically, um, yeah, the last time we did any work on the boat was nearly 30 years ago. So this shot is me when I'm 13. I'm now 42 uh, in the, in the, in the uh, front buoyancy tank of the Wayfair, and there's no way I was going to even fit in there now. But yeah, so we had a lot of work to do. Um, we, yeah, we stripped all the wood off, um, which is a really big job, uh, and, and replaced basically most of the fittings and the control lines. Um, and the boom and all, all sorts of things and new, um, new set of sails and all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, the woodwork was absolutely immense and took ages. But it's okay, that's why you have kids. So, uh, so this guy and my daughter who are at the back, so yeah, I had to lock him in the garage for about a month until he finished. <laughs> Pretty tough Christmas. Um, but he did actually manage to use the jib cleats quite effectively as a pen holder. Um, but I also had yeah, other help as well. So this is Jeremy Warren, the previous record holder, uh, and he, he was very generous. He got involved and he helped us work on the boat for a bit as well. And yeah, and once we'd done all the sanding, we eventually got to the varnishing and Dad stayed with us as Dad here and we put on basically 12 coats of varnish, which each took seven hours each. Uh, but yeah, but once we'd done it, she was looking really great. And uh, yeah, we're all very, all very pleased with how it went. The other thing as well, we had, the other thing we had to work on was um, the spray covers. So you can imagine we had to create some way of protecting, creating enough protection for us to, uh, you know, su survive the elements as it were. So we did lots of iterations of different spray cover designs. And uh, yeah, my, my wife was, um, basically was the one that basically, once we made the template, finished the spray covers. And um, yeah, and... Oh, that one's not working, but anyway, yeah, that was a, a shot there showing, uh, yeah, we, we managed to finish uh, on the driveway, doing a lot of spraying over spray covers and a lot of wet testing. But basically, in the end, once we'd, once we'd finished it all and we'd done a lot of work on electrics and everything else, and after a lot of trials, we basically managed to get to this stage. So this is one of the trials. This is one of the last trials we did before we set off. And you can see the, basically the, the general setup. And this was kind of a working system uh, before we left. So you can see here, as per normal, Rich is asleep and I'm doing all the work. And, uh, and you can see there the spray cover keeping the majority of the water off uh, while the other person can have a nice relaxing sleep, uh, as well as passage plan and cook. Uh, and you can see here we've got a lot of the gear stored on the windward side for ballast. And uh, yeah, so there's a, a bit of a insight to, to what we're doing. Okay, yeah, so just going, <coughs> excuse my voice, sorry, some of the conditions that we experienced during the trip. We had a really wide range of conditions from moments like this. So here, actually, no wind at all, and we're just sailing through apparent wind. We've got a wee bit of tide behind us. Just, this was in the North Sea, I think, again in the North Sea. So this is one of only two times we had the sails down. It was actually quite nice. We'd end up speaking in whispers because it was just the only quiet time for that two weeks. Uh, yeah, cheerful will there. It's difficult to make this man smile. I managed a couple of times. And then the breeze started kicking up, so we had some just amazing sails. Uh, quite often we'd have spinnaker up for a couple of days at a time. Uh, yeah, and again, again, just beautiful wind conditions. We were really lucky with wind. We had it pretty much behind us the entire way, other than a couple of moments uh, when I wish we had. Yeah, I mean, it could have been sailing in the Caribbean here. Well, 
almost. Yeah, I mean, what, what can I say about that really? Spinnaker up, May now. So sailing sadly past the pub. Uh, yeah, and then obviously when conditions start to pick up and the seas, yeah, the seas came up with them as well. Uh, starting to reef the main down a wee bit. I mean, this is just a progression really. Uh, it's getting cold. It's, for June it is, so, it is just cold most of the time. Uh, yeah, the sea's getting bigger, so it's just building up to one of our four gales that we managed to sail through somehow. Uh, and after that, the cameras didn't go on, basically. Was, there's just no way you're going to try and unbalance... Yeah, here you go. I mean, that's, this isn't storm either. This is pre-storm, so we stood up to take that photo. Yeah, when we're having waves come in, they're coming in over the side of the boat and filling it. Uh, yeah, you just don't have time to mess around with stuff like that. We, we couldn't afford expensive equipment. No. So yeah, so a lot of people ask what do we do for food and water in those conditions. Uh, so yeah, so we, we talked to a few nutritionists and when, during our trials we very quickly realised there was no way we could, we could cook a normal meal on the boat. The most we could ever manage was to boil water. Um, which we did uh, to basically uh, use freeze-dried food. So uh, we had two basically freeze-dried foods a day, one at six in the morning and one at six at night, and we had basically a thousand calories of porridge basically in the morning and then a thousand calories of a, you know, different evening meals in the night. And they were actually really super tasty and we were, we were really ready for them. And it's a bit of a highlight of the day actually having the hot meals. And in between, uh, yeah, we made homemade uh, brownie and flapjack on mass. Uh, and then also had nuts and stuff, and then had like a, sort of um, high-calorie kind of mixes into drinks and things like that. Um, but yeah, so you can see here, this is a shot. That's nine kilograms of brownie there. Uh, so yeah, we uh, and we had about crikey about six vats of that flapjack that we basically chopped up and weighed out. And along with the nuts and the packets, we basically catalogued it all and worked out basically how much we needed for each day. And we had basically accounted for about three and a half thousand calories a day. Can I just quickly say, Will had all of that chocolate brownie. My body wouldn't let me eat chocolate on the route for some reason. So yeah. you had nine kilos to get through. Yeah, so I weighed 15 stone at the whole, <laughs> in the whole thing, yeah. No, I didn't. Actually, as it happens, after a week, despite all that, a week after, I weighed myself and I was seven kilos lighter than I am now, and I'm not a big guy, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so with water, uh, yes, we thought about water a lot. If we, if we took all the water we needed for the month that we were accounting for at the start, uh, yeah, we would have needed about 200 kilograms of water. There was no way that was going to happen. Uh, so, yes, we looked at different water-making ideas, and, of course, a lot of them were really power-hungry, uh, and our energy budget just didn't stretch to, to that. So, yeah, we went with a, a handheld reverse, reverse osmosis um, water maker. Uh, which basically a lot of the Atlantic rowers use as a backup. And it's also, this particular one is the one that's in life rafts on cruise ships and stuff like that. So it makes about four litres an hour. Uh, so we need to do about an hour and a half of pumping a day. Uh, and you do basically one stroke every two seconds. But it has to be really pretty exact. Whereas if you, get it, if you go too fast or too slow, it stops working. And you have to spend another two minutes building it back up. So it's quite hard. And we can only actually do about 15 minutes at a time. Uh, and there's a sh shot of Rich there, and so you can see the, uh, yeah, the, the outlook hose going into a water bottle there. And, uh, yeah, and if anyone else is trying to do this, there's a, a maximum speed of seven knots. So if you're, uh, if you're going faster than that, uh, you have the, the uh, intake pipe is basically bouncing, uh, bouncing along on the surface. Okay, yeah, so do we see much marine life out there? Well, we did. We saw a lot of variety of marine life. I think we actually didn't see very much, but if you uh, click okay, on that... Sorry, yeah. Screen, thanks, Will. Uh, yeah, so the first time we really saw a lot of marine life was coming out onto the North Sea and travelling over uh, this bank here, which is about four metres deep, which I'm not sure we knew at the time, mm -hmm. and thought about afterwards if we'd had gales there, that might have been interesting. But, yeah, there's just a series of seals. to to flick it again. So, yeah, in this little video... Is it going to play? Yeah. We just had seals with us for hours and hours. There's always about 20 seals kind of following us around. There was also loads of porpoises, puffins, and if you look very carefully, in a minute, you'll see the minke whale. You have to... It's got yeah, it'll pop up in a minute. Uh, are we going to see it? What's happened? There it is! All right, yeah, so that's the minke whale. Yeah, uh, the only whale shot we got, so... 
But we did see a few other minke whales as well. Will actually nearly ran into a minke whale up in Scotland. I was asleep. Uh, yeah, and then coming back down, <clears throat> as soon as we got kind of into Atlantic waters again, we started seeing dolphins again, and that was just absolutely magic, yeah, if you want to play that, Will. Uh, so this pod here we had for about seven hours. The same pod just surfing with us for seven hours, just incredible. And what was nice is their behavior changed uh, from the start of that seven hours to the end. So at the beginning they're doing all the normal dolphin, just porpoising in and out. And it, eventually they'd start slapping their flippers, trying to wet us and things like that. And do, yeah, doing like crazy dead dolphin. I think it was a pose it was doing. I, I don't think it was dead, but just doing some really cool stuff, which we hadn't seen before. So that was really cool. Uh, yeah, just another short video. Just say, you know, just right under our hands as well. And this was in nice clear water as well, so you could see them about 20 foot deep. Oh, I think it's paused, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what is that one? Oh, yeah, pigeon. Uh, yeah, so we missed a bit of the, <laughs> missed the last bit of the pigeon. Yeah, so uh, this was a pigeon who didn't succeed in his non stop unassisted travel as a racing pigeon. Uh, yeah, it was kind of nice in a way. I had small company uh, when Will was asleep, but also always downsides about having pigeons. There was quite a lot of mess on our clothes and things like that. So anyway, eventually he, uh, he flew the nest and landed on a tanker, which I thought was a bad choice, but off he went. So, yeah, so how, how do you sleep is another very common question. And uh, yeah, the answer is r really badly. Um, so... The, the, main, the main idea was basically to have our head basically underneath the foredeck, so there's about a sort of a one foot sort of section that actually could keep some of the spray off. Uh, and then we used our temporary spray cover to keep the, the, most of the volume of water off our torso section, so it was really only our feet basically getting wet. Um, and yeah, and then, we'd, and then we'd basically distribute ourselves and our equipment around the boat to keep the boat sailing fast and, and keep it level basically. Uh, so yeah, there was a variety of different options. Uh, this is a really common one with basically our back against the centerboard case with, a, uh, with our head up the front there and yeah, and the spray cover like that. So this is a pretty idyllic sort of situation. This is coming up the east coast here. And uh, yeah, you know, life didn't get a lot better than this basically. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, yeah, and then when the wind was right behind us, then the, guy, you know, then the opposite would sleep to lured. And, uh, and then we wouldn't even need the spray cover. So th these were sort of pretty nice times. But then of course the dew's starting to settle on you at night. And yeah, and we had a lot of problems with the cold at night. So we had pretty good, yeah, and then, yeah that's another pretty good situation. That didn't happen that often. Um, but yeah, we, we, we suffered with the cold just due, due to sort of the clamminess, clamminess buildup inside the dry suits. Uh, and then at night, the, the cold would just zap through that cold and get straight to the skin. And uh, yeah, it was really quite hard uh, keeping warm. Okay, yeah, what was the scariest time out there? Well, it was kind of a number of contenders for this. Uh, one of them was when I turned to Will and said, I've just pooed myself. That was, that was really bad, and that could have been the end of the trip. Uh, but uh, Luckily, it landed, uh, only lasted for a day in ideal glassy conditions. The uh, uh, second one was probably... <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so just up here, 60 miles offshore, and yeah, we had a night gale, which was just absolutely horrendous and in the first six days I've kind of looked back and tried to think how much sleep we had and it had been maybe two hours a day max and then, and then we had a 48 and then, sorry, then we had a storm where we couldn't sleep at all and we were just shipping in loads and loads of water 60 miles offshore and both of us afterwards said we thought you know, we both thought we really want to see our wife and children again uh, and I think if things had gone badly rescue would have been very difficult, I don't think it had been very easy to find us. The waves were big, it was dark, and we were a really small boat. And also, you know, if we're in the water, even with dry suits on, we're going to get cold uh, pretty quickly. And after that, our sleep pattern, we managed 15 minutes, uh, yeah, 15 minutes helming. And that was a real struggle to stay awake for 15 minutes whilst the other person kind of tried to grab some sleep, you know, still getting covered by spray. So, uh, yeah. It's probably the scariest, one of the scariest moments. Uh, it's another one. So coming down past the smalls again. I think the gale had just started, hadn't it? Mm. Here, so yeah. And having not sailed past the smalls before either, 
either of us, I don't think. We weren't really sure what to expect. Uh, anyway, we didn't hear them. That's the upshot, which was great news. But it was kind of scary not being able to see them properly. Uh, yeah, and shipping was the other one. And, yeah, so we had a tanker. I think it was in the fog as well. It come out of the fog, and it was going across us and going, oh, that's okay. And then all of a sudden, it changes course and heads directly to us. Uh, and there's no radio contact with this tank or anything else for ages. And then eventually it comes on and says, yeah, just come to see if, if you're all right. Uh, it was nice of him to let us know. Yeah, so, and we were all right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then obviously after that, the breeze kicked in and dolphins kind of make everything seem good again, I guess. Again. It's all good. As long as the dolphins there, everything's good. <laughs> yeah, so... Another really common one is, so what do we do for, what do we do for navigation and, and power and communication and, and all that sort of thing? So yeah, so this is the thing Bobby Wade spent the most amount of time for in the prep. And, and all the trials we did, everything would, you know, would fail and fail again. And uh, yeah, and we got to some points where we were just wondering if it was sort of possible to, to actually even do it. Uh, but in the end, we've said with navigation-wise, we settled on having uh, basically a trip computer hardwired to a, a battery and solar system uh, that drew very little power, um, but that had all the numbers there to, to, to keep us going. And then we basically used a tablet with Navionics on it to, uh, to do passage planning uh, and look at tides and, and think about tactics. And then we basically shut, turned the screen off to save the power and actually lasted probably a day or two. And we had basically doubled of everything, so stuff was either on charge or being used. Um, but that's sort of what we did there. For communication, yeah, we probably had the mobile phone for, well, I don't know, 30% of the time. Um, the, handheld VG, um, the handheld VHF was garbage. That, you, that lasted uh, quite a well, You could only really talk to people when, if you could see them. Um, uh, but the other system we used was with the yellow bricks we were using for tracking. Uh, we could actually connect to them with a, an app on our phone or the tablet, and we could actually write a pretty normal text message send it to the yellow brick, and then that was sent to a server in London or something, and then people could download all the messages there. So we could actually have quite long tactical conversations with our onshore uh, team, even though we were out of mobile range, which is, which is really good. So yeah, the electrics, that was, a, that was, like I said, a really big deal. I spent a year and a half basically learning about marine electronics, and yeah, after a lot of failed web attempts, this was Mark V, uh, which basically, yeah, was the first system that truly worked in really bad conditions. And yeah, we had, a, an ele we had a full electric system that could be submerged in water up to a metre deep for 30 minutes in the end. Uh, so yeah, so I had a bit of help though. So uh, these guys in Plymouth, they were really great. I spent a lot of time in their workshop. They taught me how to solder and crimp and, and went through my wind di wiring diagrams and basically, yeah, bas worked with these guys for about a year getting, getting our electronics together. Uh, yeah, you can see that in the back, and you, you can also see that in the stand there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, just going on to some uh, <coughs> memorable moments. Uh, this was a really nice one. Again, coming over a bank which was where well, it dried out at Spring Lows. Uh, and we kind of chanced upon this. We were sailing against the tide and only making about one or two knots. And we thought, oh, we'll just go into some shallower water and see what happened. We came across Shitwash Bank, and it's basically it's like a standing wave moving you know, diagonally up the bank all the way. So we landed up pretty much surfing a standing wave for I don't know, how many hours? 10 miles. Yeah, yeah. for about 10 miles. And uh, we landed up doing three to four knots where we were doing one before. Yeah, again, this would have been a, a horrible place to have been in a storm. Uh, but it wasn't a storm, so it was great. Yeah, it, was kind of, it was kind of spooky as well, wasn't it, going yeah. over there? Yeah, especially yeah, with the spinning crap at night, surfing on a wave for 10 miles. Was... Yeah, uh, trying to think. Oh, this, oh, yeah, so this is uh, coming in between Isla and Jura. Uh, so, yeah, we're coming down, and we're worried about all the tidal races over here uh, and overfalls, and we didn't... <laughs> we, we got, I guess the planning didn't have a look at what we would do in that situation, so we just came round the headland there, and just saw that there was this non-navigable cha uh, channel and thought maybe it is navigable. Uh, and it was, which was awesome. So we just had just enough wind to get through here. And in fact, at one point, the wind died and we went, oh no, we're going to go backwards. And then just that lovely trickle sound on the hull again as we just, again, uh, and it's another sad story about passing a pub. We saw these people sat outside, just waved. That was, yeah. Another, another memorable moment, which I didn't put in here very quickly, I can't miss out, is that 
going through Pentland Firth, which was, you know, we'd lost sleep thinking about the Pentland Firth for about a year. Finally going through it, things are looking basically pretty good. Massive standing waves, but we're, you know, in good shape. And then ba Rich's bowels decided to play up, and he announces that he needs to go for a number two right there and then, just <laughs> as we were going over the Merry Men of May. So I think for all the world records, we must be, well, Rich at least must be the only person that's done number two over the side of a dinghy going through the Merry Men of May. It was memorable. <laughs> Very memorable for me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what happened to the finish? Okay, so... Yeah, so we didn't really kind of ex really think about the finish, but it was yeah, a really magical time. So we yeah, we pulled back into Sulcombe. Uh, we had to actually wait. The sponsors came on board while we were actually on the trip, which is amazing. And uh, and they'd organised basically a, a, a show for us to come in, but we came in faster than everybody thought. So we actually had to wait a night at sea before we could come in. Uh, but anyway, so the next morning it was great, and there's uh, all the family were coming in. And uh, yeah, we really had a Ellen MacArthur moment coming in with the flares. We had a little flotilla of boats coming in. It was yeah, really pretty amazing. And Sulcombe Sailing Club put the, the, the sail numbers up as we went by. And My dog came, which was awesome. <laughs> Fred, <laughs> from, from so if you ever see Fred, say you saw him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a yeah, very, mo you can imagine, very emotional, really, really awesome time. And um, yeah. So, but the, yeah, so we didn't, it wasn't without its effects. We did a lot of interviews and, uh, and things like that, and it was all good. Um, but yeah, it had, it had some. Did you do that one? There was. Oh, yeah, you were, okay, yeah, go on. <laughs> you can do it if you want. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, so yeah, there's a few things uh, that we did experience. We really struggled with gloves, they just didn't work. They're either wet all the time or you couldn't use lines, so we just couldn't use gloves. So we got really, really sore hands. Uh, I mean, not, they weren't not usable, it was just sore. So, you know, just pulling in a sheet was super sore all the time. Uh, and they took a little bit of time uh, to recover afterwards. Uh, for a couple of weeks afterwards as well, I had really sore feet. So I had some, I don't know how it happened, but I think just from sitting out all the time, just had nerve, nerves being trapped. And then I had this really like fire-like pain in my feet for two weeks. Uh, <clears throat> which went away, which was, that was nice. I think the, the best kind of after effect was, uh, well, it happened on the first night, actually, on the mooring. We we're, were moored up, uh, waiting to go up the river the next day. And it was, you know, nice, you know, nice situation. We've seen our friends on shore and stuff. And it's the middle of the night, and Will wake, wakes up, and he goes, Rich, 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 we've we got to get together. Yeah, you know, we're about to crash into the rocks. Will, we're on a mooring. Man. And that happened loads. Even when I went home, I'd go up in the middle of the night, you know, totally clear head. And I'd say uh, to my wife, Cat, Cat, I'm just going for a week. Can you take the helm, please? Uh, yeah, just things like that. that. That went on for quite a while, didn't it, I think? Yeah, about uh, a week or so, yeah. yeah other than that, you're good. So, yeah, so then, uh, so once that all faded back and we've gone back to work, yeah, what you know? What has happened since then? So it's sort of six months ago that we finished. So yeah, so we yeah we've just been doing a lot of uh, a lot of speaking, um, not actually together before, but uh, uh, yeah, speaking and then writing articles and doing interviews with uh, lots of newspapers and magazines and stuff. And uh, yeah, done some some radio interviews and things like that. And yeah, then we sort of taken the boats to different things, uh, and this is uh, our local school actually. And um, so yeah, so we've got the kids making water. And um, yeah, and trying the freeze-dried food, which is quite funny, and then and having to have a look at the boat and what have you. Uh, yeah, and also we got uh, so the, the chair of the RYA, uh, who actually I saw earlier. I don't know if he's here now or not. Um, but yeah, he he got in contact with the with the Wayfair group and said he'd secretly always always uh, always fancied doing a, a sort of a. You know, uh, Swallows and Amazons, you know, adventure cruise in a in a in a boat, and you know, would would be be interested in taking him out, which is really great. Uh, so we got involved with a, a Wayfarer trip to Lundy, uh, which they do every year, and uh, Chris was was uh, yeah, really great. I mean, it was such an honour because the weekend before, uh, he was uh, yeah, he he was um, uh, he was hydrofoiling with Ben Ainsley on Lake Garda. And then the weekend after, he was racing 90-foot maxis in the Caribbean. So for <laughs> him to be with us in Nipajija was yeah, quite an honour. Then, yeah, then I think ultimately, yeah, amazingly, uh, yeah, the, we were voted 
well, in the public, we made the, uh, the, the final uh, list for Yachtsman of the, the Year, which was uh, yeah, really a really amazing honour. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all, didn't, didn't quite get it, of course. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but to be just literally involved, everyone, and seeing all the famous people sitting around the table and, you know, uh, seeing Rich in a DJ, which had never happened before. Well, so I've uh, worn a tie in about five years. Yeah, I think, I think he's still wearing Crocs though. Um, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, a really special night, and it was a great way for uh, the whole team to basically come together because you know you do something like this, and nobody gives you a certificate or a trophy or anything. So we kind of use it as a bit of an excuse to, to you know, draw a line under it a little bit and have a bit of a party. So yeah, yeah, and then lastly, kind of. Uh, yeah, we thought when we were going around, we didn't think of it initially, actually. We thought, well, we might as well use it uh, to raise awareness and to raise some money. So, I mean, the RNLI was an obvious choice, and I know everyone here knows a lot about the RNLI, but I've been rescued by them once, so I think they're an awesome charity. Uh, so, like, half of our uh, fundraising uh, went to them. And then, yeah, so the second charity uh, I've been involved with before with kind of sailing trips, was uh, Surfs Against Sewage. Uh, and this is an amazing organisation who, I guess, almost single-handedly were responsible for cleaning up our waters originally. So they're just a very strong, quite small lobbying group who use all their money to do what they say they're going to do. So, yeah, like I say, pretty much responsible for getting tertiary-treated sewage most of the way around the country. They're also working now with, uh, you know, beach, not just beach cleanups, but ways of cleaning up the sea of microscopic plastics and and normal plastics, and also looking at kind of impacts of climate change and you know what type of lobbying they're going to do with that. So, if anyone's wondering who to join or send money to, these guys are awesome. Yes, yeah, so we landed up uh, through the sponsors actually raising uh, five thousand pounds for each charity, which was really nice to be able to do. And uh, yeah, and that's it. Wow, bang and uh, bang on time, which is a miracle. <laughs> right. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. That was really, really interesting and hugely inspiring. Um, I've got to ask, next adventure? Yeah, maybe. Sorry. It's, the common it's always, isn't it? Always. It's always something yeah. more. Oh, well, we, yeah, so no, we're not. No, nothing official. So no, we're just, but we have been uh, looking at, we've done a feasibility study on a, the first sort of transatlantic in a, in a monohull dinghy. So looking at looking at route from Dakar to the Caribbean and just doing, seeing if it was, if we could do it safely or not. So we're not saying we're doing it, but we're looking at if it's possible to do it safely or not, yeah. Great, well, good luck with that. And any, um, how are you going to rate the chocolate brownie out of 10? <laughs> well, I, don't, I, I haven't been able to eat a chocolate brownie since. <laughs> Actually, we had a lot left over, and I took it to work every day. To, and I, I, after about a month, I had to draw a line under it. I said, sweetheart, it's a beautiful brownie, but I just can't do it anymore <laughs> oh well it's been really interesting and for me also that like, the whole family it's lovely to see you know you guys are really tight obviously and the whole family involved and i suppose what advice would you give to families with kids to to go out there and have your own little adventures oh that's a good one isn't it i think uh well if you've got a boat just do it, literally just do it and you can start a any size adventure really you know, if it's just a sail from one side of uh lake or one side of a pond even, you know, just start small and work up from there, I think. Make a plan, get some snacks. Yeah, exactly, and that's pretty much what that was, you know, we, like you say, we didn't have any sponsorship or funding to begin with, so it was just a slightly grander version, but really basic, if you've got a wayfarer and a dry suit. No know. excuses. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a wayfarer, but My any top boat. tip for the parents, though, is keep the kids entertained while you're rigging up. <laughs> basically, by the time you've set the whole thing up, everybody's like sick of it. Basically, so you go on and try and uh, Good tip. yeah, yeah, keep, keep everybody entertained somewhere you know nice while you're getting it all ready. Well, one thing is, if there's other families who are going to do it with you, that changes the whole thing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a great yeah. idea. And you guys now, you're hanging out in Palm Court. Will you be there today? If anyone's mm. got any more questions, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so the boat's on display in the Palm Court area if you haven't seen already. And uh, yeah, we're there. All weekend. Great. Well, thank you so much. Give a round of applause. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks. Um.